the four areas the enemy attacks the most. In fact, almost any church you go, most of the prayer items revolve around these four areas. These four areas are the leading causes of stress in the world. They are our main pain points. Even as I speak to you, somebody here is going through one of these four pains because these are the four areas the enemy attacks the most. Number one is finances. Number two is children, our children. That area the enemy attacks the most is marriage. And the fourth area is health. There was a man who was attacked in all these four areas and passed the test. And I believe this story is recorded in the Holy Scriptures for us to learn how to handle these four areas of tests. And the name of this man is Job. And the Bible says in all these tests, Job did not sin against God. He was tested in the area of finances. He lost everything he had, his property, his assets, his money. Then he lost all his children the same day, seven sons, seven daughters. And the third thing is his marriage. The wife told him, curse God and die. So he lacked support from his marriage. And number four, his health. The enemy attacked his health. I mean, he was sick from head to toe. He had sores all over. Now, over the years, people have used the story of Job to console people who are going through difficult situations. Job loss, loss of a child, loss of a parent, loss of business. Basically, we have used the story of Job to teach how to handle loss. But today, I want to approach it from a very different perspective because Job went through this test for just a couple of weeks and I have asked myself, how come for the better part of his life, for many, many years, the enemy could not attack any of these four areas? What is this that Job had done to cover his finances, his children, his marriage, and his health, so much so that the enemy could not attack? In fact, God bragged about Job and challenged the, the devil. Have you seen my servant Job? There is none like him in the whole world. That guy fears me. He loves me. And the devil replied to God, Does Job fear God for nothing? Job 1, 9 to 10. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge, a hedge, a fence, a barricade, a wall, a cover around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Let me repeat. Have you not put a hedge, a wall, around him, I can't attack his health, and his household, I can't attack his children, I can't attack his marriage, and everything he has, I can't attack his finances, I can't attack his property, his assets. And I've asked myself, what is this that Job used to do that made him to have a cover, a fence, a wall, a barricade around himself, his health, his children, his wife, his marriage, and his property and his assets. And I want to believe if you're going through one of these four pain points, today's message will challenge you, but if you obey what God is saying, you will have that cover around you, your finances, your marriage, your children. So number one, finances. Finances. The first pain point in this planet is finances. The overwhelming majority of people, yesterday, I posted something on Facebook, and the traffic was overwhelming because I was just trying to encourage guys in this area of finances. It was shocking to see how many people are going through such extreme financial struggles. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, 19, money is the answer for everything. That's a fact. Money gives us options. If you have a lot of money, you don't need to pray for a car. You don't need to pray for a house. You don't need to pray for school fees. You don't even need to pray for green card. As an investor, you can live in any country you choose if you have enough money to invest. Most of the prayer items we have is simply because 
We don't have enough money. Money gives you power. Money makes you respectable in the human society. Money influences values. You know, when you have the money, you choose what is seen on CNN and BBC and all major TV and radio stations. We, we are basically influenced by the people with money. Money is also the means through which we preach the gospel. The gospel is free, but the means is expensive. The question this afternoon, how then do we cover our finances so that they are not attacked by the enemy? And the answer is tight. Now, now, now. That's a Pandora's box. That's a painful thing to say. So hear me very closely. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. And I hope this will touch you. Because I grew up never hearing the message of tithe. Either I didn't hear or I heard what I wanted to hear. Mercy, on the other hand, came from a family where her parents were tithing. Believe it or not, when we got married, I spoke her out of tithing. She used to tithe before she met me. I convinced her tithing is for the Old Testament believers. It has no place for the church that is bought by the grace of Christ. Why are we following the law? We should follow the grace. And I persuaded her to stop tithing. Let me tell you the result. What happened to us and to our finances for almost 15 years. I started with a business of export of fresh produce. I was exporting in five countries, seven good years, client after client after client, they were not paying or they were under pain. I had court cases in UK, in Belgium, in Netherlands, in France, in Dubai, Emirates. I worked very hard, you can ask her. Sometimes I would go all night in our code room or in our warehouse just supervising the people who are doing the packaging. And at the end of seven years, we had four huge bank loans, four huge bank loans. The bank even, one of the banks even came for the only car we were having remaining. Three times I was involved in serious road accidents, so serious that the insurance company on three occasions declared the car's write-off, Rex, 100% Rex. By the grace of God, I was not injured, but all the, all the cars were wrecked. Two times, my phones were robbed. I, lo I would lose my phones just in the streets from to robbers. Three times, I was carjacked. At one time, I was with my daughter, Ivy. She was only six months old. We were with Ivy. Kajakt. We would get into robbery, kajakings. The devourer was just on the loose on us. And twice we lost all our savings to fake investments. The devourer was on the loose in our lives. At one time I cried. I was, I was living in Dubai, trying to follow up with my payments. In the aeroplane, I cried and cried to God because uh, Zig was about to be born. And I asked God, what's going on? I, I am your servant. What's going on? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me very, very clearly. Tithe. I didn't believe in tithing. He did not explain. He did not try to justify tithe. And I cried and cried. And anyway, long story short, I went and I told Mercy I was praying and crying tears like a baby in the plane. It was a five-hour journey. And I told her, let's just try it. I did it reluctantly. For about nine months, I was very reluctant. I was doing it as a, an obligation. It was not from the depth of my heart. I was not a pastor. I rarely went to church, if you didn't know. Can I just be honest with you guys? I would preach whenever I was invited, but I was, I was not committed to any church. And I, I would preach a lot, but I was not committed. And I convinced myself, let's go back to tithe. Let's just try it out. The strange thing is this, about nine months later, I started having breakthroughs in consultancy, serious breakthroughs. In fact, my first assignment, my first assignment in Kenya shillings was 1.5 million. 1.5 million, consultancy, research. 1.5 million. I started getting jobs of amounts that are mind-boggling. We cleared our mortgages. 
we started recovering everything we had lost. Everything we had lost. We got out of all the debts we had. And I'm here to tell you, I know it works. If you struggle with tithe, the way I struggled for many years, I challenge you today, test it, try it. You will thank me later. I'll tell you something. You know, I told Mercy, you know, tithe is an Old Testament thing. We are not going to do it. And God spoke to me using one passage. Thou shall not commit adultery. Was adultery introduced by the law? Is it the law that introduced that law? I, I mean, that, that idea, don't commit adultery? No, nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with the law. Before Moses gave the law, thou shall not commit adultery. Moses just wrote it down. Today we are under grace. Thou shall not commit adultery. It is still sin. Before the law, after the law, after the cross, it is still sin. That's exactly how it is with tithe. Tithe began long before the law. Abraham tithed long before the law. Jacob tithed long before the law. Moses just wrote it down to establish it. But it has nothing to do with the law. That is why in Hebrews 7, the Bible says Jesus still receives the tithe. And if you want to listen more about that argument, I taught it in this church last year. You can go to my YouTube channel and listen to a message, Should Christians Tithe? Just go to my YouTube channel, listen to the whole message, Should Christians Tithe? For today, allow me to read you only one scripture. This is the only place in the whole Bible where God says, if you do this, I'll protect your finances from the devourer. If you do what? If you tithe. Let's read it. Malachi 3, 10 to 12. Malachi 3, 10 to 12. Bring all, all the tithe, not part of it, all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now, try me, try me, test me in this area. Give it a shot. Let's see whether it works. This is God daring you. Just try it, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sex, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, he will not destroy your business, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. When I obeyed the Lord, I started getting consultancy assignments as a consultant in the public sector, in the private sector, Almost all the large banks in East Africa have contracted me. Then I started getting contracts outside my country. I'll be invited by a company in Uganda, like Total Uganda, Stanvik Sudan, Dynafarm, Zambia, different countries, even when we came here to the U.S. My first assignment, believe it or not, I was speaking to CEOs from 70 Fortune 500 companies, 70 CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies in Phoenix, Arizona. In one single assignment, God exposed me to 70 Fortune 500 companies. I'm telling you, test this. It does work. This is the promise of God that if you bring the tithe, he's going to rebuke the devourer. This week, Thursday, there was some... Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, there was a lot of mist and fog where I live. And the sun was directly overhead, the, the, the road, the street that leads to our court. And in the morning, Masse was driving Zig uh, to school, but it's Zig who was driving. And the sun hit them so hard, I had gone earlier than them in the course of the week, Monday, Tuesday. And the, the sun was directly overhead our street, and it was foggy and misty. You could barely see. You could only drive at 10 miles an hour. Regrettably, on Thursday, there was a car parked by the roadside. And my boy, Zig, was able to see the car at about 10 miles an hour, and he avoided it. Two minutes later, our neighbor's child, direct neighbor, our direct neighbor, he went in. They're in the same school, same year. They're both juniors. He went in and banged into that car. Poop! The whole car was a write-off. They don't go to church, and I don't want to judge them. But I'm telling you, that's what I used to go through for many years. Devourer after devourer after devourer. So when Zeke came back home in the evening, 
I actually told him, it's not because you are a better driver. It is because God protects us. There is such a protection around us. God protects us from the devourer. That boy and my son, Zeke, started training the same day. At the same time, their, their ear mates, their age mates, their classmates, they started training the same time. But there is a hedge of protection around us. And I see it all the time. If you're like me, you're losing money to crooks, you're repairing your car time and again, you're having struggles with finances, I urge you, I beseech you, I'm speaking to you with a lot of love. I'm telling you what Jesus would have told you if he was here. I'm speaking on his behalf. Just try it. The Bible says, just try it. It's God there in you. Try, see whether it works. And God will keep the devourer from your property, from your assets, from your finances. I had a friend who was in Kenyatta University. I was in J Court. And she believed in tithe. Her name is Joyce. And I used to think she's stupid. I would challenge her, why do you believe in this thing? This is, why do you believe in it? And the girl, she got a job with one of the best banks in the world, literally. And then she got a second job with the, with the biggest bank in our region. And then she was posted by that bank as the head of HR in a different country, to head the HR in a different country. Within a very short period, the girl would go from promotion to promotion. Warning, warning. Tithe does not guarantee you will become a billionaire. You need to get to know the truth. Uh -uh, it doesn't say that. In fact, if you don't, the only way to create wealth is to get into business. If you don't take that step of faith and you allow fear to rule in your heart, don't imagine you're going to be a millionaire. That's a different story altogether. Tithe guarantees two things. That God will rebuke the devourer from your life. So if you operate at a small level because you refuse to take a step of faith, God doesn't guarantee you to be a millionaire. He will protect you at the level you operate, at the level of faith that you operate. Tithe protects you at the level you operate. The issue of how far you go depends on you exercising your faith, daring what you can't see. Faith is daring what you can't see. If you can see it, you don't need faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It's what you can see. So it means if you take a step of faith to step into a big business, God guarantees you he will protect that business from the devourer. I remember one day when I didn't succeed in horticultural export, I didn't know about tithe, so I decided to try a different business. And I signed a major contract, a dealership contract, with, uh, with uh, the largest perfume company in the Middle East. So I had this meeting with these guys, the directors in the Middle East. I was, I was so determined to be successful. And they gave me an exclusive dealership for the whole East Africa. They gave me an exclusive dealership. So I brought in a whole container of perfumes, hired very many salesmen and women, trained them, and released them. Nothing worked. Nothing moved. You know what I discovered with God? You cannot circumvent the laws of God. You cannot go around them. You cannot even use prayers to go around the laws of God. When God talks about gravity, he instituted the law of gravity. It doesn't matter how many prayers you do, you will fall down. If you have a seed and you don't plant it, you will never have a harvest. Planting it is the step of faith. If you don't plant it, if you plant it, in good soil, with good manure, you don't need to pray for it. It will give you fruit. That's a law. It's the law of fruitfulness. The thing is with finances, if you follow the laws of finances, you will be successful. God told Joshua in Joshua 1.8, if you follow my laws, the ones I've instituted, if you follow them, you will have good success. If you don't follow them, even if you pray for financial breakthrough, you will never have it. This is God's word. He has instituted it that is going to protect you and your property from the devourer. And I know some of you listening to me, you're having a lot of attacks in the area of your finances. If you have lived for 40 years on this planet and 50 years and it has not worked, why wouldn't you try something different? They say madness is doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. I tried business. Ask mercy. I would work for 24 hours. Ten years later, I had nothing to show. Nothing, literally. And I'm being vulnerable with you. I'm being honest with you. 
Today, after starting to tithe, for example, we started one business called the Top Pros. Of 100 employees, we are far away overseas. We are not watching over that business. Four branches at a college. It is driving. It is working. Anything we started after we began tithing has never failed. Trust me on this. That business, and I have eyewitnesses. There are people here. There's a lady there called Nancy. She has gone to Top Rose. Barbara has gone to Top Rose. Ask them. I have people, witnesses in the house right now who have gone to, that, to those beauty shops. We started them in a simple way. Masi went to China, bought some, some stuff just for, uh, you know, all the equipment. We ended up getting a very big deal, even buying the equipment. We started it one touch, and it succeeded. So I'm saying this. Why continue being mad, doing the same thing the same way, and expecting things are working? Just test it. It is God telling you, this is the only area in the whole Bible that God says, test me. Try whether it works. Try it. Even if you do it reluctantly, six months later, it will become your new norm. Let me tell you why you struggle with tithe. Because I struggled with tithing. You struggle with tithe for only one reason. You think you're going to lose your money. And it makes sense if you think you're losing 10%. Why should you lose your hard-earned money? It does not make sense to lose even 1%. It doesn't make sense. The reason tithers tithe is very simple. Tithers understand God does not own 10%. God owns 100%. The whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness their love. Everything. He owns cattle in a thousand hills. Tithers understand God does not own 10%. He owns 100%. And the only reason he's asking us for 10% is to keep our focus on our source. He is our source. To always remember he's our provider. Not our business, not our work, not our determination, not our resolution, not our sweat, not our struggle. Deuteronomy 8.18, he's the one who gives us power to make wealth. Every time you give 10%, you're saying, I remember God. You're my source. You're my provider. You're the one keeping me alive and healthy. I can refuse with a tithe, and tomorrow I'm unable to work. The tither understands he's a steward of God's property. Everything belongs to God, not 10%, everything. So tithers, trust me, tithers do not need to be convinced to tithe. In fact, there is such a distaste for eating the tithe. One day our sister Stella, who is there, gave you her personal testimony about tithe. One day, Sister Gozi was preaching here. She gave you her personal testimony about tithe. She invited me to go and launch her, her hospital. She opened a hospital uh, two years ago. And then last weekend, Marcy and I went there. She was doing a community project uh, for that hospital. She opened it, and it began flourishing. The whole community has accepted it. It's driving. It succeeded because she strongly believes in what I'm telling you. Talk with any tither. I didn't believe in tithing. I struggled like you're struggling. Talk with any tither. They will tell you exactly what I've told you. And believe me, you should tithe in your local church. That's why if you go to my Facebook page, you never see me telling people to tithe to this church. No, 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 no. I always tell them to tithe wherever they go to worship. Here is the deal. Many of you give offering. All of you, actually. 100% of you give offering. But less than 20% tithe in any church, not just our church. Any church you go, less than 20% tithe. Let me surprise you something you've never known. It doesn't matter how much offering you give, you will still have the devourer in your life. Let me give you the principle behind it. If you owe me money, you cannot give me a financial gift. You have to, give, you have to pay me first before you can give me a gift. So God says in Malachi 3.9, you owe me the tithe. The tithe is mine. So you cannot go to give God a financial gift before you clear what you owe him. And that's what the church never understands. The tithe belongs to me. So if you owe me some finance, if you have my debt, you cannot give me a financial gift. That's mocking me. First clear the debt. Then I don't then can you be genuine in giving any gift. So God says the tithe is mine. So the only way for you to be protected from the devourer the only way for you to have a spiritual cover over your finances, over your property. Do you know what? I remember one time, I was trying to train Marcy to drive with our very first car. And she hit the gate, I hit another car. I hit a car on the highway, she hit our gate. The car used to look funny. 
I taught Ivy and Zig to drive, and guess what? I was not teaching them with an old funny car like the one I used to have. I taught them with a Mercedes Benz. They have never scratched it even once. I finally gave that car to Ivy. At a younger age, we were older, Marcia and I, when we were learning to drive, and we were messing up with our little car. They were younger when they were learning. Zig was only 15. He has never, ever scratched any car. He has never scratched them. I'm telling you, there is a God who protects us when we obey the principle of tithing. I know it. I've gone through it. You have experimented with the devourer for too long. He has messed you up. You've been losing money to cons. You've been losing money to things. Why are you still experimenting with him? Experiment with God. He's saying, please test me on this. If that didn't convince you, I leave you to the Holy Ghost. Let's go to number two. Because only the Holy Spirit can convict, convince you. I can't. My job is to speak the word of God. And you have had the testimony of many people in the church. Truth is established in the face of two or three testimonies. Number two, children. The second area the enemy attacks the most is our children. Parents are crying for their kids, especially teenagers and young adults. We all love our kids. We want the best out of our children. We want our children to succeed. We invest heavily in our kids. We spend so much with our children. We don't reserve anything. In fact, the Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord. Psalms 127, 3. And the question for every parent, how do I cover my children from attacks? How do I cover my children from the enemy? There is only one way in the Bible, train them. Again, I say these are the laws of God. So it doesn't matter how much you try prayer and fasting, it will not circumvent the law of training children. Proverbs 22.6, New King James Version. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. You see, if you don't want your horse to be wild, you've got to train it when it's young. If you, if, you know, you can tame a bear, a lion, and a tiger only when they are young, when they are cubs. If a lion goes to the jungle, it's born in the jungle, kills a buffalo, kills a zebra, and then... Ten years later, you try to tame him, he will kill you. The only way to tame them is when they are kids. I, I remember playing with tigers in Thailand. Why? They were picked when they were one day old. They look like all the tigers in the jungle. They were huge and massive. But they were picked when they were cubs, very young. So they were tamed. That's the word here to train. It's to direct. Look at the NIV. Start children off on your screen. Start children off on the way they should go. That's from the beginning. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Start them off. Start them off right. Look at the New Living Translation. Direct your children onto the right path. Why? There are many paths. Show them the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. Warning. They might leave it for a while. The best parents... No matter how much you pray for them, and they can deviate for a while. But this is what I have found, and I have spoken about parenting more than 400 times. This is what I found. If you train kids the right way, and they deviate, and I'm one of them, ask mercy. There is a time I could hardly go to church. This is what I found. I grew up in church. The moment children are raised up, say, in church, even if they refuse to go to church three, four years, they will finally come back to church. Does that make sense? They will always find the true north. So what is to train? To train means to role model. With children, they don't just listen to your words. They listen to your life. They observe you. They learn by observing. They are trained by observing your behavior. Your eager management. That's how they learn. What do you do when you lose a job? When you, what do you do when you're annoyed by somebody on the highway? What do you do? When you're upset? What do you do when you're tired? How do you speak when you're frustrated? When there's no money in the bank? When you're feeling unwell? What do you do? How do you behave? They are observing your behavior. You know, I know this may sound funny with you, but 
before I even left for college, if I stayed for three weeks without buying Marse flowers, she would challenge me. And when she was leaving for college, she told her brother Zig, make sure this guy buys mother flowers. So right now, if I stay for two weeks and I have not bought flowers, Zig tells me, have you bought mommy flowers? So imagine I have to be reminded. So how much a husband will he be? At least I still buy it when he challenges me. I still buy them. But it's embarrassing I have to be reminded. So I imagine he will be a much better husband because at least for them to challenge me, they first saw me buying flowers. Before they started putting me on my toes, they saw me doing it. Do you agree with me? They saw me doing it. Now they even demand it. But they saw me doing it. Because how you behave as a wife is how you model marriage for your daughter and for your son. How you behave as a husband tells your son how to treat women and tells your daughter what to expect from her future husband. How you behave when people annoy you on the road tells your children how to manage road rage. The most effective way of training children is bringing out the best out of your own behavior. The most effective way of training others is bringing out the best out of your own lives. You know what? I don't need to convince Ivy or Zeke to do it in school. Trust me. Education has been modeled in their home so much that they don't need to be told to excel in school. You'll, you'll be surprised. Both of them are A students, all A students. But you'll be surprised we don't sit with mercy to explain to them about academic excellence. We don't sit to explain to them about the need for a university degree. It is so obvious. You cannot live with me and think otherwise. Because it comes out second after second after second. My whole way of life, I emphasize education too much. That even if you didn't believe in it, you would find your way back to school. Masses in school as we speak. You see, when you do something consistently, it becomes the new norm. Why do children stop touching fire? Even when they're one year old, even less, they don't touch fire. Because fire has integrity. Fire burns all the time. Fire doesn't care whether you are two months old or a hundred years old. Fire will burn you. Children learn not to touch fire because fire is consistent. Fire consistently burns. That's the principle with parenting. If you consistently go to church, children strongly believe God is real. They think God is serious. Even if they refuse to come for two, three, four years, they will find their way back to church. If you consistently treat your partner with respect, they will treat their partner with respect. If you content, consistently speak the right language, your working vocabulary is clean. Trust me, if you hear a child using vulgar language, somebody in their house uses vulgar language. You agree with me? Yeah. I've never heard one vulgar word in my house. Why? We have never used we have never used such words. So the Bible says, do it when they are young, and they are going to follow that path. And don't worry if you have done your part. They will always, there is a compass you have instilled inside of them. Even if they try to deviate, that compass will find them back to the true north. Just do your part. How? Role model. Model the behavior you want out of your children. That's why ladies listening to me, I urge you to totally respect your husband if you want your daughter to retain her marriage. Husbands listening to me, you've got to love your wives if you want your son to retain his marriage, to know how to love. And this brings me to the third pain point, marriage. Marriage is the third pain point. Now, believe it or not, every four people you meet in the US or anywhere in Europe, Australia and New Zealand, every four people you meet, at least one has gone through divorce. And divorce is painful and tragic. I'm telling you, you do your analysis, perhaps more than the rates I'm giving you. Why? Because, of course, marriage is complex. It's not like other areas because you're involving someone else. No matter your good intentions, you're involving somebody else. They used to say it, it takes two to tango. So that makes it very complex because we are talking about two people. And Hebrews 13, 4, 
Marriage should be honored by all, both by singles and by the married. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Marriage should be honored by all. We should only sleep in our marriage bed. That's what the Bible is saying. If you don't do that, God will judge. And it's true. When we cross these boundaries, more often than not, God allows the enemy to attack our marriage. Many, many marriages don't survive extramarital affairs. Some survive, but many, many of them don't survive. So the question is, how do I cover my marriage? How do I cover my marriage? You'll be surprised with the answer. The only way to cover your marriage is love. Nothing else, nothing more. Nothing less, nothing more. I know this, and I want to say this because church, we are, we are very funny people in church. There are people who will go for overnight vigils, praying and fasting for their marriages, and they wonder why it doesn't work. Let me tell you today why it doesn't work. As I say, that I repeat again and again, the laws of God, you cannot go around them through prayers. You cannot circumvent through prayers. You can't. Look, look, 1 Peter 4, 8, 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. Take each other out. Buy each other flowers. Go for vacations. Talk to each other nicely. Make love. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. When you love someone, you overlook their faults. When you love someone, you overlook their weaknesses. When you love someone, you focus on their strengths. When you love someone, you focus on what they're doing right not where they are going wrong. You might ask me, but pastor, what is love? The good news is the Bible answers everything. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 explains what is love. Love is patient. So, if you're married, love is patient, you, 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 you don't give up on your partner easily. You give them time to change. Love is kind. You can open the door for your wife. Love is kind. You can fix meal for your husband without complaining or for your wife. You talk to them with low tones, nicely. You're not harsh with them. Love does not envy. You're not in competition. You celebrate when your partner is doing well, when they graduate, when they thrive. Love does not boast. It's not proud. Pride comes before a fall. Where there is pride, the marriage cannot stand. You cannot combine narcissism and marriage. Love does not dishonor others. It doesn't embarrass others. Where there is love, you don't correct your partner in public or in the presence of anyone. You only correct them when you're two of you. Love is not self-seeking. It's selfless. It seeks to give. It doesn't ask what is in for me, but what can I give into this marriage? What can I deposit? Love is not easily angered. We all get angry. Because we are created in the image of God. But the Bible says in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down when you are still angry. But love is not easily angered. It's pride that makes people to lose their cool so quickly. It is not their tribe or their race or where they come from or their genes. It's pride. Where there is no pride, you don't get easily angered. So when you lose your anger, you find a way to deal with it. You drink some cold water, or you get out of the house for a walk, or you go scream in the woods so that you come back to home when you are a bit sober. What you do with anger is a choice. Anger is not a choice. It's a human emotion. What you do when you are angry is a choice. If you lose your temper anyhow, and you continue praying for your marriage, you're wasting time. You cannot break these laws and trust God for a good marriage. Let's continue reading. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You don't remind your partner how they cheated on you three years ago. No, no, no. Once you forgive them, you push forward. You open a new chapter. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. I have counseled couples where a husband is so excited that the wife blew up the car, blew up her job, blew up her health. That's not love. That's malice. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love protects the partner from in-laws, from your ex. You don't allow your ex to fight with your partner. Love always protects the partner. Love always trusts 
That means you're not suspicious with your partner. You trust them that whatever they're doing is in the best interest of the family, the way they're handling their finances. You also trust them when they're with other people. Love always hopes. Hopes for a better tomorrow. Hopes for better resources. Hopes that the family will improve. Love always perseveres, doesn't easily give up. Love never fails. Infatuation fails. Love never fails. Why? Because God is love. First John 4, 8. Love is God. This is the only virtue in the Bible equated to God Almighty. If you have time, listen to one of my sermons, Eight Tests of True Love. It's in my YouTube channel, Eight Tests of True Love. The fourth area that the enemy attacks the most, are you learning anything, guys? Even if you are challenged by the message, just know the pastor loves you. I'm speaking to you with a lot of sincereness. I'm speaking to you what Jesus would have told you if he was in this service today, with a lot of sincereness. If there is any sincere pastor on this planet, I am. I know that. The Holy Spirit is my witness. I speak to you from the bottom of my heart. I have zero self-interest in this ministry. I've told you that before. Zero self-interest. I'm here to serve God and God alone. Zero self-interest. I can tell you, my wife and I have sacrificed a lot for this ministry to stand, just to ensure that the word of God is taught and taught right. Most people in America cannot tell you the things I tell you. Again, it's homosexuality. They cannot tell you that because they're looking for numbers. They cannot tell you the truth about tithe because they fear you're going to run away from church. They cannot tell you these things. I have told you before, and I say with humility, apart from these drums that one of you bought, we actually bought with mercy all the sound system you see here, the music instruments you see here. We take care of the worship team without bothering the church. So these things when I tell you, I tell you from the very bottom of my heart with a lot of sincereness. And the Holy Spirit is my witness. The fourth area the enemy attacks the most is health. Now, this is another tricky one because of the churches we grew up in. Most of us, because of how we were taught, we, do, we don't think healing and health is our portion. We actually keep praying, if it's God's will, let me be healed. This coming Sunday, I'm going to focus on health and health alone. I'm going to prove to you from scriptures that sickness comes from the enemy. And I'm going to pray for the sick. If you have someone who is sick at home, please bring them. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in divine healing. Matthew 8, 17, GNT version. He himself, Jesus, took our sickness and carried away our diseases. I have to touch this today because this is one of the four areas the enemy attacks the most. On 1st of September, the year 2020, I went to the hospital because for two months I struggled with shortness of breath and chest congestion, or so I thought. Marcia and I tried everything we could to rectify the problem because for me the hospital is the last resort. I was jogging, as I normally do, when I suddenly realized I could hardly breathe, I could barely breathe, and I had to sit down. I nearly died, by the way. I nearly died. I sat down. Uh, I was very athletic before then. I would hike almost every week. Almost every week. And I sat down. I stopped jogging. I, could, I was gasping for breath. And I was confused. And I went to all green. I know there are pastors who tell you they don't buy medicine. So I just like being real with you. I went to all green and looked for any chest decongestants. And I tried to manage my condition for two months, but nothing was working. And on 1st of September, 4 a.m., uh, all my systems started closing down. And I rushed to hospital. I drove myself to hospital. I went to hospital, and within one hour of preliminary tests, the doctor told me, you're suffering from acute heart failure. You have been having this condition for at least six years. You have not gone for treatment. Your aortic valve stopped closing, so there is blood leakage in your heart. As a result, your heart has dilated from three and a half inches to seven inches. It has become very weak, 
and has been pressed by other organs. We have to put you on oxygen immediately. And on and on, she continued with the report. It was a lady. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was going just to be checked my chest. And anyway, I wrote on my FB, and I asked people to pray for me. And they mobilized prayers. Prayers began pouring in from different countries. And they believe it is the prayers of the saints from different nations that kept me. Four days later, I was uh, operated, and they put a mechanical valve in my heart. It ticks like a clock. But in ICU, I started asking God, is this scripture true? Matthew 8, 17. Is there either me or you? One of us is lying. He himself took past tense. He himself took our sickness and carried away our diseases. How many here know health is a bigger miracle than healing? Does that make sense? Living in good health is a bigger miracle than being healed. Does that make sense? I started asking God, how come you took away my heart failure and I've gone through it? Your name is at stake. People follow me from different nations. You have embarrassed your name. And God start, started speaking to me something very unique from that ICU table. And I want to share with you what God spoke to me. How can you cover yourself and your family from attack on your health? Because sometimes God allows his servants to go through issues for the sake of the healing of the church. You see, like God removed the cover from Job for us to learn so much about protecting our finances, our children, our marriages, and our health. So I believe sometimes God allows us to go through certain experiences as his servants to empathize with others. The same way Jesus came to empathize with our weaknesses. So God revealed to me something mysterious. The way to cover yourself and your family from any attack on your health is the Holy Communion. I know that sounds strange. But hear me, children of God. I wish the best. I wish I always wish you the best. So I want to convince you that you don't have to be sick because we tried it as a family and sickness stayed out from us from that moment. We actually do Holy Communion every Monday as much as practically possible. We spend about 15 minutes every single Monday just doing communion together. I'm saying this because, you know, we, do, we serve communion here every third Sunday. We, Protestants, and Pentecostals in particular, there are many, many good things we do right. And I know this is going to sound strange to you. The one thing I can tell you the Catholic Church beats every Protestant church. It is their teaching on Holy Communion. Hear me before you misquote me. Because this is the one area I believe the only church that gets it right is the Catholic Church. Two things. Number one, they serve the Holy Communion every single service. They call them Mass. Every single Mass, they serve the Communion. Number two, the Catholic Church never talks about Holy Communion elements and symbols like we do here. All Protestant churches, we talk about Holy Communion elements and symbols. They don't say that. They talk about the body of Christ. Jesus never, when Jesus was holding that bread, he never said, this is a symbol of my body. Jesus never said that. I don't know where we got that from. He never said these are elements or symbols. Jesus was holding bread and he said, this is my body. Take it as often as you would, often, in remembrance of me. The Catholic Church understands that. They actually believe they are literally taking the body of Christ. Guess what? Data after data after data, wherever there is a high concentration of Catholics on this planet, they have the highest life longevity. That's the funny thing. Because there's a close relationship between health and longevity. So this is my suggestion for you. Before your own pastor talking to you today agrees to serve communion every Sunday. <laughs> Do it in your homes at least once a week. Do it by faith. As you do that, open your mouth and profess as a family. By his stripes, we were healed. His body was broken that we may be whole. 
He became a curse on the cross that I may be blessed. He became poor on the cross that I may be rich. What, what you're saying is that poverty should never come near you. He was bruised that I may be healed. Sickness is illegal on your body. Curses, generational struggles are illegal on you. He was raised up naked that you may be clothed. What does that mean? To cover your shame. Everywhere you go, you should be honored and glorified, not embarrassed. And he died that you may live. It's illegal for you to die young or premature. David said, I will not die. I will live to declare the praises of the one who died for me. It's illegal for you to die prematurely. Try the communion. It works. So we do it as a family. We take 15 minutes. And the good news is this. At home, you choose the wine you want and the bread you want. You choose. The church picks juice and calls it wine to avoid debates. You know, church, we like debating over everything. Jesus served them wine, not juice. He served them wine. So in church, we try to moderate these things. So I challenge you today. Do it as often as you can, if you are able. Please do it every week. If you don't have somebody, you live alone. Serve communion alone every week. Do it and make those professions. This is not my discovery. This is the Holy Spirit who revealed to me. And let me read for you two scriptures. Now, before I read these two scriptures, when the Jews were living in Egypt, that is the first time the Holy Communion was served. So God gave them instructions for the bread. The bread was without yeast. They call it in, Ju in Judaism unleavened bread. And uh, I went to a Jewish Holy Communion in a ship, in a cruise. We were cruising with mercy from UK to Spain. And we were serving the communion. By the way, I actually joined the Jews for their Holy Communion. I joined them because of two reasons. One, it was free. And number two, I was curious. I wanted to know how the Jews served the communion. I had even asked them whether, I told them I'm a pastor, can I serve communion? They said, you can't, you're not a Jew. So they serve very, very fine wine, very fine, and unleavened bread, and they eat one bread. They don't do the way we do it here. They have to break one bread. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, the very first communion was when they were living in Egypt. Then after that, this is what most people don't know. They ate communion every day for 40 years until they reached Sinai. And the Bible says none of them became sick. They didn't receive the miracle of healing. They received the miracle of good health. They became sick after Sinai. And that's when Moses erected the brass serpent for their healing. Because in Sinai, they broke the covenant of God. They started trying to follow the law and to fulfill the law of God. They told God, we are well able to fulfill your commands. They blundered. Before Mount Sinai, they lived at a grace. So let me show you the secret. Psalm 78, 24 to 25. Psalm 78, 24 to 25. He, God, he rained down manna for the people to eat. What was manna? Human beings ate the bread of ages. They ate the bread of ages. That's communion. Psalm 105, 37. Then he, the Lord God, he led the Israelites out. They carried silver and gold. And all of them were healthy and strong. All of them were healthy and strong. King James Version says, there was not one feeble person among their tribes. There was no one feeble among them. None was sick. This is the miracle of good health. Not the miracle of healing. Why? They were eating the food of angels. They were eating communion. Manna. God gave them manna every day. And none of them fell sick. None of them. None of them fell sick. Didn't you just say, as he is in glory, so we are here on earth? So was Jesus ever sick? Was Jesus ever depressed? Or oh, some of you don't know. No, he was distressed, but never depressed. Never depressed. And he was never sick. And that's our inheritance as God's children. And by the way, he never lacked. Never once did Jesus lack anything. And that was his prayer for us, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. So here at the communion table, Jesus, look at me everybody now. Look at me, look at me. The physical body of Jesus served the memorial body of Jesus. 
to the spiritual body of Jesus in preparation for their glorified body, four bodies. Let me repeat, and these are my closing remarks. The physical body of Jesus, holding the bread, the memorial body of Christ, he served it to the spiritual body of Christ, the church, the disciples, the spiritual body being prepared for the glorified body, a body that will never be sick, a body that will never die. That's the meaning of communion. Amen? So I conclude by telling you this. Tithe to protect your finances. Love your partner deeply to protect your marriage. Train your children to protect them. And number four, take the communion as often as you would to remain in good health. Every time you take the communion, you take the blood and the body of Christ. In Leviticus, God said, the life of an animal is in the blood. In Psalms, the Bible says, Jesus poured his soul. He poured his life. In essence, he poured his blood. By pouring his blood, he poured his life. So every time you take communion, you take the life of Christ. You take his life. You change your weak life, your weak body, for the strong body of Christ. A body that could never get sick. That's what you're trading every time you take communion. So Jesus said, do it oftenly. Don't do it once a month or once a year. Do it as often as you can. And when you do that, you always make those professions. Amen. 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 We have to end there. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for your word this afternoon. I know the things I've shared with your children are not easy. It's not easy to tithe. It's not easy to train our children. It's not easy to love our partners. It's not even easy to have Holy Communion as often as you desire of us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you may convict this, your children. Teach them. Bring alive the word I've spoken to them. Cause it to bear fruit, fruit that will abide, that their joy may be full. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you been blessed by this message? Please leave a comment and share this video with others. Are you blessed by my ministry? You can partner with me in ministry by sending me your love offering every month through the giving options that I have shared with you on the screen. And if you'd like directions to come to our church in person, drop us a message by WhatsApp at 678 815-3402 and we will text you our church address. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification bell to get notified when I upload new videos. I upload new videos every week. Thank you so much and God bless you.